Hey everyone, welcome to the Career Matters Podcast. This is your host, Nassar Ahmed. And this is episode 76 of the Career Matters Podcast. And this episode is, is a new series I've decided to uh, discuss based on some of the recommendations from my uh, listeners and readers of the site. It's going to be called the Productivity Expert Series. Uh, as the name suggests, I will be interviewing experts who will help myself and you, the listener, get a better understanding of how to manage your time more, how to do better at your job or to better, do better in your career. And the whole topic would be how to enhance your productivity. So uh, for today's expert series episode, I'm interviewing Liam Martin. He's the co-founder of timedoctor.com and staff.com. We'll hear more about these companies as we go on. But first of all, I'd like to uh, say, hey, Liam, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Before we get into the topic and a little bit more about yourself, I'd like to ask, uh, where are you calling from? I'm actually calling from Ottawa, Canada, which is the capital of Canada in between Montreal and Toronto. Well, that is interesting. I, I am a fellow Canadian myself. I'm based in Toronto. Oh, there we go. Not too far away. So Ottawa is a beautiful city. Anyone who's been there can attest that. A lot of history culture. For those who have not been to Ottawa, Liam, what would you say are some, actually, why don't you share like a fun fact about Ottawa that people usually do not know about? Uh, One of the things that I think a lot of people wouldn't know about is the reason why the city was chosen as the capital. The city was chosen by the queen because we're we're a parliamentary democracy. So the queen of England was the one that chose where uh, Ottawa was going, or where the capital was going to be. And the reason why she chose Ottawa versus Montreal, which was much larger and much better developed, and Toronto, which was around the same level at that point, was because she was concerned that the Americans were going to invade Canada. And if the Americans were going to invade Canada, you wanted something, you wanted a city that was as far back from the uh, St. Lawrence River, which is division between Ottawa, or sorry, between Canada and the United States as possible, so you could keep running the state. So if there was an attack, you could create a counterattack from Ottawa, whereas uh, Montreal and Toronto would be very quickly enveloped by the Americans. So that's actually the reason why it's the capital and why we have... Ottawa is an interesting city. It has a lot of government money inside of it, kind of think of Washington, D.C. when you think of Ottawa, <clears throat> but just the Canadian version. And so we have all of this government money and uh, it creates for, a, it sets a the situation up for a very beautiful city. So um, I'm quite happy that she made that decision. I am actually surprised about hearing about that. And at the same time, I, I've been in Canada for the last 12 years. I've visited Ottawa a couple of times. Mm-hmm. I'm kicking myself for not knowing that. That's, like an, ex, that's an excellent fun fact, actually. That's yeah. a very, uh, I, I can bet that most Canadians do not know that. So thanks for sharing that. No problem. Um, and uh, I've been to Ottawa a couple of times. It's, it's a smaller city than, it depends, I'm talking about the downtown core. However, uh, there's always something happening. Um, I know we are recording this end of October, but July 1st, 2017 was Canada's 150th anniversary. The entire city of Ottawa was very festive. So it was a, it was a special landmark event for Canada and that this year was specifically different for Ottawa. So that is great to hear. Okay. So before we get into the topic, I'd like to know a little bit about, I always like to know a little bit about my guests. So could you share with us how you got here from What motivated you to start timedoctor.com, staff.com? I'd love to hear your journey. Sure. So uh, I actually started, probably it started in graduate school, and I was pursuing graduate degrees at McGill University, and I was teaching a class at McGill in intro sociology. And I was very excited about it. My plan was to become a professor. And or at least get into academia 
in some way. So I took that class uh, or I gave that class and it was an absolute disaster. I started with 300 students. I ended up with about 180 by the end of the semester. So not very good numbers. Uh, I didn't get very good reviews. And I remember talking to my supervisor saying, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, you're not very good at this. Uh, so that was very uh, direct honesty. And so I realized, well, what should I do? And he said, well, can you write 150 pages? Because then we can get you a master's. And so about a month and a half, two months later, wrote that out, got the master's and was off, off to the races. And this was around 2007, 2008, right when the economic collapse happened. So it was also a perfect storm for me because I was finished grad school, but there were no jobs, or at least jobs for people who have graduate degrees in social sciences. So I ended up teaching, uh, well, actually more specifically, tutoring, because I found out that I really liked teaching, but I didn't like being an instructor. I didn't like lecturing. So I ended up starting with a couple tutoring students. Those turned into five or six tutoring students. and within about three to four months, I had more than I needed. And I realized that if I could just tutor these students online, so do it through Skype, then I could expand my reach. So I started doing that. That actually ended up being a lot more profitable for me because I could pay the same amount of money, but I didn't have to actually go to see these students and then turn that into a tutoring company. That grew to hundreds of tutors within about two years in Europe and in North America. And that company ended up not necessarily failing, but could not expand because of one critical problem, which was inside of the business, I would have, I would pay, a student would pay me for 10 hours per month of tutoring time. And then when I would give them the bill, they would say, well, I didn't work with my tutor for 10 hours. I only worked with them for five. And then I'd have to go to the, to the tutor and say, did you work with the student for 10 hours? And the tutor would say, of course I did. So who's telling me the truth? I don't know. I'd end up having to refund the student for five hours and pay the tutor for the full 10 hours. And I ended up losing money in the deal. And so that was a major institutional problem that I had inside of that business because all of these employees were remote. They weren't in a central place. So I could not actually figure out what they were doing. And so that was how Time Doctor for me was really born. Uh, my co-founder had a very early alpha of Time Doctor. And I realized that this tool could completely solve my problem inside of my tutoring company and realized that I had to work on it full time. So that's kind of how we got to Time Doctor uh, as a company. That's very interesting. So you were like the ideal customer, then you joined the company. That, that's... I believe that if you're going to start a tech company, if you're gonna start a tech startup, you must scratch your own itch. If you do not scratch, so as an example, let's say that you wanted to build a piece of software to be able to keep a restaurant up and running, like a restaurant CRM. Uh -huh. If you don't run a restaurant or if you haven't run a restaurant for years, you'll fail. Uh, you need to scratch your own itch. So you need to actually have a product that you would use every day because then you're the ideal customer. And then it's very easy for you to just even feel with your gut through what features you should apply to the software as opposed to if you are doing something that's completely out of your realm, then you actually have to talk to a lot of customers to be able to get that feedback. And you shouldn't stop doing that at any mm -hmm. point. So I talk to customers every day about uh, Time Doctor and Staff.com. But you need to be able to at least be able to make your own gut feel, a mm -hmm. gut choice about, oh, okay, this is the direction that the software is going to go. That's an ex excellent point. St uh, scratch your own itch. And I think that applies not only to an entrepreneur who starts a business, it could be someone who's a freelancer, it could be someone who's working in a job, because at the end of the day, no matter what you do, you're solving someone's problem, either it's a customer or a, a client, when you, when you can actually live the pain of, or the challenges the other person faces, you're able to better help them. That yes. is, that's an amazing takeaway there. So let me, uh, now I would like to get into a little bit more about the whole concept of 
Time Doctor. So very quickly, if you can expand on what Time Doctor does and how you help the users of the platform. Sure. So right now I have a task um, that I'm currently working on through Time Doctor, which is podcast. So I just have a generalized task that I've set up called podcast. And there's a whole bunch of different, it's a task manager inside of Time Doctor fundamentally. It sits on your desktop and I've been tracking this entire podcast for approximately 17 minutes. And so at the end of this call, I'll be able to analyze how much time did I spend on Zoom? How much time did I spend on Gmail? How much time did I spend on a Word document as an example? And I'm able to compare that to all the other podcasts that I do and figure out, number one, what are the clear metrics for doing a podcast? And then secondarily, what are, uh, how can I do that task more efficiently? Or, you know, what are the results even correlated to this particular podcast? Do I think I did a good job? Am I going to get really good? Are we getting really good feedback from this podcast? How can I analyze? How can I put that inside of the analysis? So in essence, it's kind of like Google Analytics for your workday, if anybody uses Google Analytics, or it measures all of the metrics that you do while you work. So it measures websites, applications, mouse movements, and keyboard movements. And then from a productivity perspective, we actually, our clear focus is we want to be able to make you more productive. So we don't want to just account for how long you work, but how productive you are while you're working. So you're alluding to effectiveness and efficiency, uh, the factor of productivity, because a lot of people want to get uh, spent, uh, many people measure the amount of time they work on a task, but what you're saying is you take it a step level where you want to make sure that whatever tasks they have done, they're becoming effective. And yes. I'll give you an example. Uh, how long do you think the average employee does work in an office? I have read that it's every, even though they have an eight hour shift, they work less than five hours. It's a little bit lower than that. Um, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's between, so physical work. So I'm talking about someone, let's, let's say their primary way of working is through a computer. Right. Right. So if they're not at a computer working, they're doing things around work. So they're doing a meeting to be able to go back and do more work or they're doing, or they're having lunch or they're chatting with somebody, all these things around work. So that works out to about two and a half to three hours per day is actually spent physically typing on a keyboard, interacting with the computer. And so when you look at that and you look at in comparison, the amount of time that they spend in the office, that's actually a really interesting ratio. So as an example, I have an office that I go to here for Time Doctor and for staff.com. So I'm able to correlate how much time did I actually spend working on my computer versus in the geographic area of the office. And this is automatically collected for me so that I can know, okay, what's that ratio and can I work on getting that ratio up? And there's two ways of getting that ratio up. Either spend less time at the office or spend more time working. And both actually increase productivity uh, fundamentally for us. So we don't believe, as an example, that you should be spending eight hours a day in the office. I actually think it's a really bad expenditure of your time. You could probably spend four hours in the office and get exactly the same amount of work done. And it's never eight hours, right? If you add the commute time and all that, sure. you're spending like 10 hours, uh, 10 hours a day. The average commute in North America is 52 minutes one way. Uh, I think 50, it's more than that, depending on some cities. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you that question. I mean, why is it two hours? I mean, if why is, you said they only spend two to three hours uh, of their eight hour shift. Why is that? There's a lot of different reasons as to why that happens. So uh, there's a lot of different reasons connected to it. Generally, there's a lot of things that are done around work that are not necessarily work. So preparation for work. Meetings are a major black hole when you look at actual overall productivity. Do those people, let's say that you have a meeting with 10 people, do all of those 10 people need to actually be there? Why are they, why are those 10 people in that meeting? Do they all need to be there for the same amount of time? Could they come in at different stages? Um, most developers, as an example, it, it's a perfect example of what I would define as kind of more productive individuals is um, they'll do stand-ups. So they'll do like a five minute stand-up per day, 
where they just describe all the things that they're going to be working on and whether there's any blockages that they're currently experiencing. And sometimes they can actually do that in a staged way. So even kind of where they'll have the project manager that will be pulling teams of three to four people in, going through 20 minutes, and then the next team comes in after that. So from an efficiency perspective, there's just a lot of things around work. And if you're able to optimize those different things, then you can be a lot more productive in your workday. The second issue, which I think is one of those things that corporate America will not really be able to accept, is the eight-hour workday is an inefficient application of time in order to actually get the ideal output from the employee. So a much better work week would be about, or sorry, work day would be about five hours a day. And there's a lot of studies to be able to back this up, mm -hmm. about five and a half hours a day. So if you reduce, if you basically pull two and a half hours off of a work day, but then pay that person the same amount of time or pay that person the same amount of money, their output will actually go up. And this has been proven time and time again, but that's not what we do in North America. And that's actually not what we do in a lot of different countries. China's even worse, to be honest with you. They have probably, they, they work very hard, but they have one of the lowest outputs per hour any, of any country, and they work Saturdays. They only, they only actually rest on Sundays. So the model that we have is most of the models that we have for work are based off of managerial studies or qualitative data. When in reality, when you actually apply large-scale quantitative data, so we have tens of thousands of customers that use Time Doctor every single day, and I can run a report very quickly and figure out who's more efficient and why. Mm -hmm. Other, and there's no database like this has ever existed in the work world before. So it's very easy for us to be able to analyze that and say, oh, of course, it should only be five and a half hours a day. But from a managerial perspective, if you talk to Deloitte, you know, Deloitte's not going to say that because, number one, that's bad for Deloitte's business model. But then secondarily, that just goes against decades of, of management training. And I do agree with that because if you go back the 50, 60, ever since Henry Ford designed the eight-hour work week, uh, going back beginning of the last century, it has become a norm. And a lot of people have not even questioned why that is. But at the end of the day, if you measure output versus time, I think that model would be better. And to, I read this recently where Sweden is one of the first countries where they're instituting a six hour work week. Basically, they, and they, they are actually starting to prove that, that in six hours, they can get as much work as eight hours. Yeah, that was, that was one of the earmark studies that I really looked at. And it was kind of the, when I saw that study, I said, man, we've been looking at this for years, <laughs> at least in our data set. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I'm a sociologist and statistician by training, and I just love to be able to kind of look at the deep insights that we can gain from this type of data set that really hasn't been available until um, applications like mm -hmm. ours have really come onto the market. So it's a very exciting time, I think, also for the realm of productivity. I, you did mention at the beginning that you are more of a Google Analytics for like a good analogy for Google Analytics for Workday, right? So, yeah. so far we talked about the problem. The problem exists. And regardless if you're an employer, freelancer, or an individual employee, you have sensed that problem. You have faced this. Everyone complains there's not enough time in the day. So why, why do we have to get deep? I mean, what is the, I'm, I'm asking you a very, uh, qu a question I believe most people ask is, why do we have to go into depth in terms of how, what I'm doing every day? So you don't necessarily need to go into depth. You need to have, my personal perspective is what doesn't get measured does not get managed. And so if you, don't measure what's happening to you on a daily basis, then you really won't be able to improve upon it. And if you don't want to improve upon it, then there's no problem. Uh, if, you want, if you do want to improve upon it, even being able to see what you do on a daily basis will actually give you a ton of productivity gains. I'll give you one example that's personal for me. After about four to five months of using the beta of Time Doctor and working on it every single day, 
I discovered a trend which was Tuesday afternoons and evenings were really bad for my productivity. I now take Tuesday evenings off, Tuesday afternoons and evenings off completely. I basically stop working at around 3 p.m. And the reason is that, number one, I wasn't able, actually able to detect that my productivity was going down without the tool in place. But then secondarily to that, I realized by looking at the data, I was being constantly distracted on Tuesday afternoons. And uh, you'll know this from Toronto. In Canada, we have cheap movie Tuesdays. So two mm. movies are half price on Tuesday evenings. And the calls would start around two in the afternoon saying, my girlfriend would call me saying, hey, do you want to see Superman or Batman? I'd say Batman. And then she'd say, well, I don't know if I want to see Batman. Can you go into Rotten Tomatoes and tell me what the rating is? Do you think Suzanne wants to come? Why don't you call Suzanne? Uh, why don't you go onto Facebook? We're messaging you on Facebook about which movie we're going to see. And this debate starts happening and this constant distraction machine kind of comes up on Tuesday afternoons. So I realized that by actually just not working on Tuesday afternoons and instead applying some of that work time somewhere else, so I actually move it over to the next day, I work extra long on Wednesdays, my productivity went up. The amount of time that I was spending at work on that Tuesday afternoon, I was getting maybe, my efficiency was maybe 20%. But then on a Wednesday, if I can take that same amount of time and drop it onto a Wednesday evening, my efficiency is 50, 60, 70%. So why would I want to force myself through a Tuesday afternoon that's not productive when I can just take Tuesday off and go for a Wednesday that's more productive. And I wouldn't have been able to really understand that because a lot of people don't really understand all of the subtle distractions that occur in our lives. So going back to the tech industry, from a consumer technology perspective, most technology companies that are successful are successful because they know how to distract you more than other applications. So Facebook is very good at distracting you. Uh -huh. Online games are very good at distracting you. Their entire business model is based off of, I can distract you more than other things on the internet. So there are literally hundreds of thousands of people that are thinking all day long, trying to figure out a better mousetrap to basically grab you and distract you. And then you want to be able to get away from that. That's actually another big factor that we have inside of our software, which is if there's any application that you find distracting, so Facebook as an example for me is quite distracting. If I were to go to Facebook right now, I'll get a pop-up within about, within about five seconds saying, are you still working on podcast? And then I can either say, no, I'm not. And then I'm put on break. So I'm psychologically no longer working or yes, I am still working on the podcast because maybe I'm looking you up on Facebook or something like that and I can complete that task and then come back um, to what I was originally doing. But it allows you, basically it provides that simple reminder to say you are currently leaving productivity, you're, mm -hmm. you're possibly leaving a productive state, do you want to truly do this or not do this? And so I think that that's, we're kind of, there's all of these, there's this arms race happening on one side and we're trying to counterpoint that by building weapons of ourselves to be able to, you know, be a counter to the distraction economy, which is what I really call it. And that's actually a great insight and a great example. Thanks for clarifying that. And I can totally relate to that. Facebook, LinkedIn, anything, on, even in the internet. And even, sometimes I'm writing an article, I'm researching something, and there is some, there's a shiny object on the page that I'm researching then instead of taking three hours to write an article, I end up writing four and a half, five hours. So, and uh, yeah, and one of the things you can, like they always say, time is your most precious commodity, right? Mm -hmm. Anything else, you could be replaceable. You can improve your skills, make more money, but nobody, uh, it's the greatest equalizer in the world. Nobody can get back time. So um, that's, that's a great example. So we talked about the individual employee or the knowledge worker. I want to switch gears and talk about managers because when you're in a leadership position, you're not only responsible for managing your time, but you're also responsible for managing your team's time. Where do you think leaders, managers, employers struggle with that right now? 
in managing employees effectively? Yeah, I, I know it's a common challenge and most managers end up spending more time at the office because now they are managing more people. I know what I've said is more of an anecdote, but I'd like you to expand on that. Is that, is that true for? So we started, we started a very interesting uh, experiment where we had managers rate their employees from one to 10, one being the worst, 10 being the best. And we then implemented uh, a machine learning algorithm inside of Time Doctor to be able to figure out what correlations does a 8, 9, 10 group have across all managers versus a 1, 2, 3 group. And the only real clear signal that we got was that the 8, 9, 10 group had more, um, their communication with their manager was a lot higher. And so we kind of actually interpret that as um, the butt kissing algorithm. So <laughs> we, we realized that there's actually a lot of difficulty in trying to, so managers do not know who good employees are when you measure their productive output. And I'm not talking about their emotional intelligence or their intelligence as it applies to um, working well with teams. That's actually, that's something we can't measure, but we're only looking at output. So as an example, you have a Salesforce CRM. I can tell you very easily who are the top reps that are putting out the, you know, that are getting the most amount of sales. And then I can also tell you who's getting the least amount of sales. And then we can run those correlations and we actually figure out that there are, those do not necessarily correlate to managers really liking them. In reality, they might actually dislike them quite a bit. They may think that they're bad team players, as an example. So one of the things that I would suggest that managers do is the biggest thing that they can do basically is remove their own personal bias. Uh, And that's just based off our own research. So if they can remove their own personal bias towards somebody. So there may be somebody that they don't necessarily get along with, or maybe someone that can't communicate very clearly, but that person may be very good at their job. Their output Mm -hmm. might be fantastic. And that's what you need to be able to really look at. So again, it just goes back to what isn't measured, isn't managed. They're not measuring output in the ways that I believe they should be measuring output. Instead, they're measuring output by who makes me feel the best, who's keeping me updated with what is currently happening inside of, you know, their workday, who do I get along with more, as opposed to, well, who's the best person for this particular job? Who's putting out the most amount of widgets per hour, which is realistically the only thing that you really want to measure when you're looking at overall work productivity. And then there's secondary ones like, If someone's a really good worker and highly productive, but everyone else hates them and they're actually bringing down the productivity of the entire team, then that's another problem. So another example is we can measure this back on a reverse angle so we can figure out, well, which employees are the lowest in productivity, and then we can also figure out, well, maybe there's a correlation between the manager. So there's maybe, let's say there's 100 managers and we find that something that they all have in common, a low, empl- low performing employees would be bad managers. And then if we just remove those managers or retrain them, then we'd actually see an overall boost in productivity from those employees. So it's very kind of, sometimes it's very counterproductive and you need to be able to basically focus on the metrics that are quantitative as opposed to the metrics that are qualitative. And this is kind of, I have my own personal I don't necessarily want to call it war, but I I think that a a lot of managers are not looking at the core metrics of productivity. They're just looking at what makes them feel the best. And that's qualitative. It's not quantitative. And you need to always measure, okay, I may not like John, but John's doing a fantastic job. And as long as I can make sure that John is still happy with his coworkers and everything's working properly, I want to just accelerate John uh, as much as possible, even though I personally may not like him that much. That's a great analogy because um, I think the classic analogy I always draw is to the show office. 
And if you've seen in sales, because I work in sales full time, sometimes the highest producers are promoted to management, but that doesn't necessarily always work out very well because the measure, in, uh, the measure between a good manager and a good salesperson are two different things. A lot of companies make that mistake. You also spoke about personal bias and that applies not only to managers, but also to individuals as well. And that's why data, I ask this question for the benefit of the audience. I personally am a big data nerd. I, my entire life la, runs on Excel spreadsheets. I measure everything. And if I don't measure anything, I find that that area of my life gets affected, whether it's my finances or my health or how I manage my time. So the summary of what you just described is instead of putting personal bias or any type of emotional bias, let the data tell you the story. And in that way, you are able to make better decisions for the team. Yep. And I think probably if you add quantit a quantitative layer to your qualitative perspective, um, you may actually be able to train your, your bias even better. And I'm also not saying that they're, like sometimes managers have fantastic bias that they can deploy. And once you've trained it properly, you can almost kind of tell who's going to be a winner and who's going to be a loser. Sales is a perfect example of that. So as an example, inside of Time Doctor, we have machine learning algorithms so that we can, and this is one of our beta products, but we can predict whether that sales rep is going to be, let's say, in the top 10% of your sales team within a month of them using the software. Because we're able to figure out the unconscious triggers that produce signals of success or failure. So huh. how often do you document inside of your sales, you know, your CRM versus being on the phone? Just as kind of a spoiler, generally, um, if you're about 40% on the phone and 30% on your CRM, that's pretty much your most successful breakdown. And no one's really measured that um, at scale. And they've measured it as a study, but they've never necessarily measured it as a large scale. They, they haven't had thousands and thousands of people that are measuring their second by second workdays uh -huh. inside of a database like this. So for us, that's been a really interesting insight and we're actually using it inside of our own company now. So I want to ask you a couple of fun questions. Uh, you already covered Facebook, but in your experience, because you are, you're, you're trained in this, you're a specialist in this, what are the top three productivity killers for everyone across the board? Clash of clans. That is probably the best. So if you want to pay attention to who, um, there's a video game called Clash of Clans. <clears throat> yes. It is one of the best, absolute best distraction tools we've <laughs> ever detected. It is absolutely amazing um, how well this can distract people. So Clash of Clans is by far number one. If you, if you want to get like laser focused on it, Clash of Clans is number one. Number two is another one made by the same company called Clash Royale. So these, uh, I can't remember the name of the, of the web design firm, but they just got sold for multi-billions and billions of dollars, the company that makes both of these video games, because they're so good at distracting people. Huh. And these games make hundreds of millions of dollars per month. And basically the game is um, you have a, uh, a base that exists and other people can attack your base but you need to provide defenses but people can attack your base at any time and then you're sent a notification when your base is being attacked and then you can defend your base or rebuild your base or build better defenses it's a genius ingenious distraction model so those two applications massive for distraction and then the third one and so the the reason why those come to mind is because they're just so high up on the list. I couldn't really give you a third one, but in terms of just general kind of actions, uh, having Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and Snapchat notifications is probably one of the, uh, I could put that all into one category. That's a major, if you can actually remove all of those notifications, uh -huh. so uh, from your computer and from your phone, that's going to be huge for your overall productivity. So what I'll do is um, generally at the beginning of my work day, I'll make sure that I get one thing done that I wrote down on my to-do list the day previous. So I don't go into email immediately. I have a rule, which is don't go into email before noon. 
generally I'm able to make sure that I can, I can do that pretty much every day. There are some, sometimes that I have to kind of jump in early, but uh, generally I, I can fight that off until noon. And then the other thing is removing all of those notifications. So removing all the notifications from your Iva Mac, uh, they're most Facebook will automatically set up a notification system. So whenever you get like a message, it will literally pop up inside of your Mac. Get rid of that. I get rid of Skype notifications, get rid of Slack notifications. And then I break out time to be able to become distracted by those things. So Slack notifications, as an example, Slack is like a messaging system for teams. And I'll usually get into that once a day at a certain time. And the only way to get in touch with me immediately is through sending me a text through my phone. And very few people know what that phone number is. So let's say that there's an emergency inside of the company, I would get a text or a phone call from somebody. So generally that pulls out the vast majority of distractions that are throughout my workday. That's what I would suggest that people do if they really want to get a couple more hours um, inside of their work. So the next question uh, I would like to ask you is, in your experience, based on your studies, based on your, uh, based on your opinion, what are the three, top three habits of highly productive people? Kind of already described those. Uh, so it's very difficult to get a clear signal on what habits of productivity are inside of people. So we have very specific variables that we set up as goals or triggers. So like quit prediction, as an example, is something that we have inside of Time Doctor. So we can tell you with an 89% accuracy rate whether you're going to quit your job six months before you do. And generally, we can also have some type of reasoning because there are unconscious triggers like I need to get paid more or uh, I'm moving on to another job or I'm really frustrated with my job and I'm really frustrated with my manager. So these, these kind of things we measure um, specifically. But for general productivity, I mean, I would just kind of boil it down to the stuff that's happened to me personally in my life, which is don't email, Slack notifications, Skype notifications, they're all black holes. Again, they're all this sort of distraction economy. They're built to distract you. So trying to be able to make sure that you're not distracted by those things is really important for getting core hard work done. I'll give you an example. During this podcast, I've had a bunch of you know stuff that's beeped on my phone. I actually turned my phone over, made sure that it doesn't vibrate or it doesn't beep for me so that you just removed all of those notifications automatically. So that really allows you to focus more. There's a theorist. I don't know if you've ever heard of flow state focus. I'm pretty yes. sure that you have. So that just means you have flow state focus in essence means I have everything around me to accomplish my task and I'm excited about accomplishing that task. Mm -hmm. So if you start a task, but you don't have the right pieces to do the job, so let's say I'm going to write an essay in a notebook, but I don't have a pen. And I sit down and I start working, and then I think to myself, oh, man, i got to go find a pen. Guess what? You just got distracted. So you need to be able to have all those pieces in place to be able to accomplish the task. So kind of extrapolating on this for the digital space, I've done all of my research for writing a blog post, as an example. I have my outline set. I know exactly what I'm going to write about. I have all the research, so I don't have to go out and do that research because that's another opportunity to get distracted and then I can just knock it out. And generally it would be, hey, turn off the internet and just knock it out for an hour or two. And then you can have a, a fantastic piece that's put together. So making sure that you're not distracted is by far the most important variable. I wish I could be a little bit more helpful in that, but anything that got a little bit more specific, like um, not checking email before 12, breaking out particular times to become distracted, those are good strategies, but they're all problematic because you could get back into the situation where you do get distracted by them without being disciplined. So, you know, I can go into email, I could spend an hour doing it efficient, efficiently, or I could spend four hours doing it inefficiently. And sometimes I spend four hours doing it inefficiently because I just get distracted inside of email. Uh, where maybe that'll go into a Basecamp thread and then I read the Basecamp thread and then I say, hey, I think this is wrong and write something about it inside of that Basecamp thread and then we have debates about it and then it leads to a phone call. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I've spent three to four hours on something that should have taken 10 minutes. 
I'm not the one who can kind of, I can give you indicators, but fundamentally becoming less distracted is by far the most important thing that you can do to be more productive. Those are excellent points. And thanks for elaborating on that. With that, we have, come, we have come to the end of our interview. And before we wrap up, Liam, any final words that you would like to share with the audience? You can go to timedoctor.com to be able to sign up for a completely free trial of the software. So you um, can try it for 30 days. Let us know what you think. And if anyone has any other questions that they have about productivity or being distracted at work, you can always email me. My email is liam, L-I-A-M, at timedoctor.com. Wonderful. I'll make sure to include those in my summary notes when the episode goes live. Liam, thanks for uh, joining us. You shared lots of great insights. Personally, very, very exciting for me to learn all this as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this episode of the Career Medis podcast. I have written a brief summary of the interview uh, in the show notes, and I will be sharing it on the blog. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode and also learned something new, feel free to post a comment or a review. If If you really, really enjoyed it, please go ahead and share this amongst your network. Until next time, this is Nisar Ahmed, your host for the Career Medis podcast. Thank you.